I open my eyes to see the spiritual truth today. I open my eyes to see the spiritual truth today. And over your ears, I open my ears to hear the spiritual truth today. I open my ears to hear the spiritual truth today. Now if you put your hand over your heart, just extend out your arms. I open my heart to receive the spiritual truth today. I open my heart to receive the spiritual truth today. The spiritual truth that I'm working with today is that Great Mother Earth, simply another name for God, Great Mother Earth is inherently balanced, is endowed with balance. And because Great Mother Earth is simply another name for God, and we know that the presence of God is who we are, we are endowed with balance. Now, for those of you who are visiting today, we don't believe that we are all of God. But we do believe God is all of us. And if we can begin to wrap our head around that and begin to become familiar with some of the attributes of God, like balance, when we can do that, we will know a new joy on our, in our life. Now, there are some of us, myself included, who kind of flow more to more extreme behaviors. Some of us for whom moderation is not even mildly attractive. <laughs> But even those of us with those conditions, we have balance inside of us. That is our natural state. Balance is actually our natural state. The problem is we rescind the invitation to bring balance into our lives. We don't recognize that we have balance in our lives. And here's the problem. When that happens, we're unhealthy. When that happens, we're unhealthy in body, mind, and spirit. When that happens, when we don't have balance in our lives, we're crabby, we're fearful, we're suspicious. When we don't have balance in our lives, we create conditions out there that will reflect, reflect back to us that we are ugly, that we are poor, that we don't have any creativity. When we don't have balance in our lives, we create a world that can feel like it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. But see, here's the thing. We start using words like overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed in this world. But the truth of the matter is, overwhel the only reason we're overwhelmed is we're out of balance. That's why we're overwhelmed. See, th there is no boss that can be overwhelmed by God. There is no mate that can be overwhelmed by God. There is no debt you have that can be overwhelmed, that can overwhelm God. None of those things can overwhelm. Your children can't overwhelm God. Nothing can overwhelm God. And the presence of God is within you. So you have every bit of capability of not becoming overwhelmed uh, in this lifetime. See, the good news for us is that God created God, Elohim, Allah, the Bat and the Matman, the sacred grandmother tree, the goddess, whatever you want to call that essence of love, has created for us a holiday in which we can be reminded that we are in balance and we're at this holiday. It's a holy day to remind us that our natural state is a state of balance. It's a natural state to say, look around. There is day and there is night. There is joy and there is sadness. There is activity and there is rest in our life. Just look around. That's, that holiday is called the spring equinox. Sometimes spring equinox. It's the grandmother of all the holidays, the spring holidays coming up. It's the grandmother of Passover. It's the grandmother of Easter. It is a pagan holiday. Now, for those of you who've been here a while, you've heard me say that the word pagan simply means of the countryside. That's all it means. Devil worshiping is not a pagan concept. It's a Christian concept. Pagans don't worship the devil. They worship two things, creator and creation. Religious scientists, we worship two things, creator and creation. Because we know it's all God. It's all God. So we can get rid of this idea that they're over there and that we're over here. 
we in fact are all in some ways pagans in our lifetime and that does not mean that we are bad look the the pagans they study with as much scholarship great mother earth as we do the bible the bhagavad gita the quran they study with as much scholarship the earth and they can find the same spiritual truths that are available in any sacred scriptures on the ground in earth in the air in the birds of flight they can find the same absolute freedoms that you and i can find well spring equinox brings us the celtic goddess ostara ostara is the goddess who brought us bunnies to show us abundance at the at the uh, you know because bunnies are very abundant <laughs> Ostara brought us Easter eggs that are colored. And we're, by the way, we're inviting you to bring Easter eggs in, uh, candy in little plastic Easter eggs. We've put a basket of empty Easter eggs out there that we saved from last year. You take them home and bring in candy. Now, those of you who don't believe in candy and children should mix. <laughs> Just take a pass. Don't, don't put a little affirmation in there. Don't put a penny in there. <laughs> We want candy in there, all right? <laughs> we won't put a little tiny tube of toothpaste in there. And... No, just take a pass on it and let it go. <laughs> See, <clears throat> but here's the thing. Spring Equinox, like Easter, is deeper than bunnies and, and Easter eggs. It's really about new beginnings. It's about balance. It's about if you haven't had balance in your life, use this as a new beginning to bring more balance into your life. Spring Equinox is about new growth. It's about a new hope for any discord in your life. You know, there was a great demonstration of spring this week. There's been sunshine, there's been rain, there's been beautiful clouds, there's been great morning red suns and great evening red suns. It's been a great demonstration of spring in my life. My, my hope is that all of you have taken a minute this week to notice the new growth in your life. Yeah. It's all around. You know, here is the thing about spring equinox and spring itself is that there are shoots coming up, new energy coming up from the ground all the time and from the buds of the trees and we can take that energy and bring it into ourselves. But you have to notice it's there. See, my guess is that we haven't stood in front of a tree simply to contemplate a new growth and begin to look at it and praise it and appreciate it in this week. My hope is that you will take next week. The reason we don't do that is because we're always dashing, aren't we? We're dashing from one thing to the next. Who has time? to look at a little flower just beginning to push through the earth or a new bud on a tree. Who has that? Because I'm a dasher. We dash. We like to produce things. We dash from one thing to another. We dash from one project to another, from one chore to another, from one self-help book to another, from one fat diet to another. We're just dashing all the time. Why do we do that? Because we think we need to in order to achieve our goals. But I am here to tell you, if you will embrace balance into your life, you will reach that goal much faster than if you spend all of your time just dashing toward it. If we can begin to remember to slow down and to allow the earth to nurture us during that time. We try all the time to prove ourselves. That's why we're dashing around also. We, we forgot that we're whole, perfect, and complete, just as we are right this second. We forgot that God knew what God was doing when God created us. Whole, perfect, and complete doesn't need any help from us now embellishing who we are. We just need to grow in our authenticity. We just need to grow in that which calls to us in our lives. See. We don't need to prove anything to anybody at any time for any reason. We don't need to prove anything to anybody for any time 
for any reason in our lives. We are enough. If you are breathing, you are worthy. Now, I like to say that three or four times a year, so let's say it. We're going to say it three times. I'm breathing, I'm worthy. I'm breathing, I'm worthy. I'm breathing, I'm worthy. Now, look, you can just treat that as a little Sunday thing you said in church. Wasn't that sweet? Or you can bring it into your life as an affirmation on especially those days when you feel funky about yourself. When you don't like how you look, you're going outside, you don't like how you look, or your boss said something to you, or your beloved said something to you, or whatever it is, and you don't feel great, you don't feel whole, you don't feel perfect, you don't feel complete, I'm breathing, I'm worthy. I'm breathing, I'm worthy. See, if you're breathing on this planet, God knows that you are worthy. Now notice that I didn't say worthy and entitled. Entitlement and worthy are totally different things. See, entitlement suggests that there's somebody out there that owes you something. There's somebody out there whose responsibility it is to give you what you want or what you need. We're all grown people here. There's nobody out there who is responsible for giving you what you want or what you need. And the good news is they don't have to because God's already done it. God's done it already. God will give you it's God's job to give you what you want and what you need, and it's already done. It's on the table. And when you're rushing around and so out of balance, it's very hard to see that which has been laid before you on your life. See, you are worthy of people speaking nicely to you. So say that with me. I am worthy of people speaking nicely to me. I am worthy of love. Say that. I am worthy of love. I am worthy of oodles of money. I am worthy of oodles of money. I am worthy to be a creative outlet for my creativity. I am worthy to be a creative outlet for my creativity. That's a long one. That's like what I... When I marry people, I always promise them I'm just going to make three words, no more than three words. But you're worthy of all of those things and so much more. You are worthy and the table has been set. They are here. Those things are here for you now. But you have to open up. You have to know that you're worthy. See, good won't come to people who don't think they're worthy. Good will not come to people who don't think they deserve it. If you're always running around saying, I'm not enough, the universe has only one response to you, yeah. and that is yes. yes. So it's better to run around and say, I am worthy. I am worthy for that which can come into my life that is good in my life. See, today, this day, this spring equinox day, March 15th, Women's International History Week Day. And men, you too. This is the day that you can put to bed that notion that you are not enough. That you are not enough. You can let that go. You can retire it today. You know, we can slow down and have more balance. And when we do, we just feel. I promise you, it's counterintuitive, but I promise you, you will feel more worthy when you're not running around just doing everything, everything, everything. You will feel more worthy in this life. When you take time to feel the sun on your face this spring, and you're not doing anything else but feeling the sun on your face, you will move yourself closer to your goal than if you were doing an activity right then. If you will take time to just listen to music. You know, I've noticed in my life that I don't just listen to music anymore. I listen to music, but I'm driving. I listen to music, and I'm doing my taxes. I listen to music, and I'm praying. I listen to music, and I'm cooking dinner. I listen to music, and I'm doing something. Now, it's all appropriate music. It's all appropriate music to those things. I listen to meditation music when I'm praying. But I rarely 
just listen to music. Now I notice that I'm of an age where I, I thought, well, where did I used to listen to music? I used to go to clubs. When you go to clubs, you just listen to music. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to go to a club to listen to music. You can just stop what you're doing. Sit down. Oh, we hate to do that. <laughs> what if somebody sees me just sitting down? You've given them a gift. If that's the case, you've given them a huge gift. You know, the daffodils, the lilies of the field. Maybe some of you have been up to Daffodil Hill. The daffodils, they neither toil nor spin. They just sit there. And they feel worthy of our gaze. They don't do anything. And we appreciate them. They fill our lives by just being. We fill the lives of other people when we are just being, not doing, but just being. Not toiling, not spinning, but just being. We fill other people's lives with appreciation. Ernest Holmes says that anything that we learn can be unlearned. I want to add to that. I want to say that anything learned or unlearned can be relearned in a different way. When you came to the planet, you knew. You knew. You're just relearning. You knew that you were as beautiful and as gorgeous as the lilies of the field. And it took you a while to forget it. Because when you were an infant, when you were a baby, and all you could do was sit there and look up, people loved you. <laughs> they went to the crib and they looked down and they filled their hearts. And grown people started saying silly the coo coo. <laughs> they knew that. And then we set up expectations. Time for you to walk. Time for you to say some words. Time for you to learn how to ride a bike. Time for you to learn how to save some money. And when they didn't do that in the timetable that we wanted them to do that to, we started teaching them that horrible lesson of you're not quite enough. You're not quite up to snuff in your life. See, there's nothing you need to adorn yourself. There may be some subtractions that you'd like to have, but there's nothing you need now to re, re, to do that. By, but relearning that you are worthy is a spiritual practice that takes persistence. It is not a fleeting thought. You know, sometimes we say an affirmation and it becomes a fleeting thought. The affirmations are never meant to be said once. They're said to be repeated over and over and over again with persistence, with a commitment that it's true. And that's true here, too, with relearning that you are worthy. So I'm going to give you a couple of steps, three steps here to take. They're not new. You've heard them before. You knew them when you came to the planet. But it's always good to be reminded of these kinds of steps. The first one is stop comparing your insides to somebody else's outsides. You've heard that before, but we still do it, don't we? We continue to do it over and over again. Do you know that most crushes are not romantic? They're platonic. There are people that we see on the outside and we want to be just like them. And we start crying because we're not just like them. And we start giving them power and we put them on a pedestal. And we feel bad that we can't be up there with them, but we're glad they're up there because we need them to be up there. And then because they're human, they make a mistake. And when they make a mistake, we don't let them fall off the pedestal. We knock them right off the pedestal. And half of us, when we knock them off the pedestal, we're sad because they're no longer our crush. And we're happy because we're not crying as loud as we used to be that we're not like them. And we caused all of it. You know, we forget that everybody on the planet is human and has to make mistakes for their spiritual journey. It's how it works. Their mistakes are their gifts to their spiritual journey. 
They're not for our entertainment. You know, when people like Brian Williams and Bill Cosby fall off the pedestal, what we do is we start talking about them. And we go to news shows and we buy magazines that will give us the latest scoop, the latest dish. But we're spiritual beings. Our work is to pray for them. Amen. Our work is to pray for anybody who falls down. It's not to talk about them and take them to the office. <laughs> and the way that helps our worthiness is because we know that the next time we fall down, People in our church are praying for us. They're not talking about us. They're praying for us. So the first one is stop comparing your insides to somebody else's outside. The second one is leave the past where it belongs, which is in the past. Leave the past where it belongs. See, here, here is the thing. Most of us on this planet were raised by people who didn't understand they were whole, perfect, and complete. So it was impossible for them to pass that on to us. They might have tried, and some of them may have actually done it. But most of us were raised by people who had no sense of being whole, perfect, and complete and could not pass it on to us. And so the things that happened to us were as a result of people without that consciousness. Now our job is to know they couldn't possibly do any better than they did or they would have. They were working with the very best consciousness they could. Some of them fell down very badly and I don't want to I don't want to uh, uh, mitigate that or underestimate it or anything. It was bad. Some people had very bad childhoods. It doesn't it doesn't excuse them, but it explains what happened. Leave it there. Leave your childhood, no matter what it was, leave it there. Now, some of us were blessed to have people in our lives who worked with children, whether they were teachers or Boy Scout leaders or whatever it was that they did, Girl Scout leaders, whatever. And they helped us when we didn't have families could help us. They helped us restore some sense of self-esteem. So if you're in the church this morning and you're a teacher or a scout leader, or have ever been a scout leader, or anyhow worked with any children, will you just stand up and let us appreciate you right now? grateful for each and every one of you and I call on all of us I went to a great church service last night you know sometimes the minister needs to be ministered to and so I went to center of praise to to be ministered to and they were talking about a new ministry called side by side and what it is is just regular people not clergy not practitioners not anything just regular people sitting side by side with those who are hurting having an opportunity to share love and share compassion and share empathy with those people. I encourage all of us to do it because we don't know. We do not know who it is that we're impacting. I was at a family dinner uh, several months ago. It was around the holidays and, uh, and one of my relatives was just berating uh, a three-year-old boy because, uh, because he couldn't do something. And, um, and, it, and it just broke my heart. And, and I went to my sponsor and I said, you know, what is it that you do in, the, in that kind of a situation? What is it that you do? And what she said was so wise. She says, you make sure you tell that little boy the next time you see him how great he is. How wonderful he is. Who have a past, we have to leave it in the past. Okay? So, uh, I have a story that uh, there, there was a, a client of mine in Santa Rosa when I was a practitioner and she had hurt her shoulder and she loved gardening. And you know, uh, those of you who are Catholic know that there is a Catholic gardening planting system. My father used that all the time. He planted all the vegetables according to uh, the Catholic planting system. I'm not going to go 
there, but <laughs> but that was she was going to do that as well. And so <clears throat> what happened is she hurt her shoulder and she couldn't play. And so her husband, who was working two jobs at the time, said, "Honey, I can't help you. I can't turn over the earth. I can't help you. So I want I want you to do is just hire a gardener." She could not hire a gardener. She couldn't do it. And so in the practitioner session, I said, "Well, why is it that you can't?" Why is it that you can't do that? And she said, you know, my parents always thought that people who had gardeners were rich. And I don't want anybody to think I'm rich. See, we, a lot of us have that working class mentality. Now, not wanting people to know you're rich is a whole different sermon. But the notion, the very notion that rich people are the only ones who have gardeners. See, she's still in the past. Everybody, a lot of people, most people, many people have gardeners these days, somebody to help them out. You don't have to be rich to have a gardener. It's like people, rich people you know, used to be the only ones who had their nails done. Now everybody, well I don't, but everybody, <laughs> everybody goes and has their nails done. See, we have to leave those old ideas that we had where they belong, which is in, which is in the past. The, the last one is and this gets, this gets very interesting and tough. Reframe everything in your favor. Reframe, leave nothing out. Leave frame, reframe everything in your favor. Because it is. Because it is. See, everything that's ever happened to us, is happening now, will happen to us, has a gift in it. And that's where we need to put our attention. It's in that gift that is in it. Now, I've told this story a million times. I'm going to tell it again because, in case somebody hasn't heard it, and also because it's a good thing for us to be reminded of. It's the story of six-year-old Rogelio. Now, Rogelio was going to go to his grandfather's. His parents were going to get a weekend away. His, Rogelio was going to go to his grandfather's for the weekend. His grandfather didn't know a lot about kids, and he decided to go out and buy him a plastic ball and a bat. So when he came, he'd have something to do. Well, Rogelio was in the house, and he was bored watching TV and bored doing anything else. And so his grandfather said, honey, take your new ball and bat out in the backyard and play with it. And so he said, okay. And so he went out in the backyard and he took the ball and the bat and he, he tossed the ball up and he took a swing and he missed. He tossed the ball up, he took a swing and he missed. He tossed the ball up, he took a swing and he missed. He did this about 30 times and the grandfather had been watching him for the last few minutes and he went outside. He was worried. And he said, honey, how are you doing? And the kid said, Poppy, I'm the greatest pitcher I ever lived. <laughs> That's reframing everything. That's reframing for your good. You can take your sorry bank account right now, and you can look at what it is and pay attention to that, to the money that's in it. You can take your body that you're always complaining about and you can begin to reframe it and give it compliments right now. You can take your marriage that is having some struggles right now and instead of concentrating on that, concentrate on what your beloved is bringing to the table. When we begin to reframe everything, you will be amazing at how it turns things around for you. I invite you to use this powerful holiday of spring equinox to allow you to be infused with new growth in your life because it's there waiting for your recognition. Let's take this message into prayer, knowing that there is only one power. It's the power of love. It's the power of Allah. It's the power of God. It's the power of Goddess. It's just the power is within us. I give thanks for that. I give thanks for every single person in this church. I give thanks especially for our beloved Chris in the bookstore handling this transition with grace and ease. I give thanks for the board of trustees for making the tough decisions in this, in this church to create an atmosphere where we can love and laugh and play. I give thanks. I release this word into the law together to say. And so it is.